All right, here we go. We have a hip hop legend in the building, Juvenile. Welcome to Vlad TV. Hey man, my first time. Glad to have. Glad you have me. Oh man, I'm such a long time fan. Uh, when 400 Degrees came out, I felt like that really changed hip hop as a whole. Hey man, thank you, thank you for the comment, man. Oh yeah, and then so many hits since then, and such a big impact in general that it's really just an honor to actually sit down with you. Hey, it's all love. All right, it's our first time here. I want to start in the very beginning. So you grew up in New Orleans. Yeah, yep. Okay, Magnolia Projects. Magnolia Projects, really the whole uptown a little bit. Uh, I had a grandmother stayed in the Melfamine Projects. M my mom and my, 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 my dad's mother stayed in uh, Magnolia Projects, so kind of like backwards and forward. Okay, Magnolia Projects has been spoken about, you know, in music so much, but being a kid and growing up there, what was it like? I would, I would kind of, you know, compare it to like growing up in the Bronx or Harlem somewhere, you know, being in, you know, uh, you know, low income area, uh, high crime, you know, school right there in the project, my, my middle school right there next to the project. Um, pretty much everybody out there in my neighborhood, we pretty much looked at ourselves as, uh, as brothers, especially if we was outside of the hood. We go somewhere else like a party or a DJ. We stuck together. But uh, growing up in the project, it was rough, man. We had it rough, man. You know, as a kid, when you're growing up like that, you don't really realize that you're poor or you're in the projects up until a certain situation starts to happen. Yeah. Now, what was the situation that made you realize where you really were? Man, probably coming from school and seeing my furniture on the sidewalk. Uh, you know, I think that's probably the lowest of the low, getting put out the project. Um and, you know, feeling like, you know, that there's nowhere else to turn, you know, um, being embarrassed amongst your peers. But embarrassed, you know, not not embarrassed like you would be if you lived in a, a rich neighborhood because, you know, everybody in that neighborhood is used to, you know, being financially straight. And the projects, everybody poor. It could happen to anybody. So you don't get criticized or, you know, people don't look down on you when, when things like that help, happen. They tend to reach out and help you. And that's what I am. I'm a, I'm a product of that. A lot of people reached out and helped me. I mean, in terms of the violence, like what were some of the most violent things you saw growing up? Murder, 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 man. You know, I mean, all the time. You know, um, I didn't have friends I went to parties with get murdered. I didn't, I didn't walk outside seeing, you know, outside playing with my partner, see somebody get shot up right there, you know, in, in the middle of our football games. I done had cousins got murdered. I done seen cousins murdered. I done seen, I done seen every kind of murder you probably won't see done with a, with a, with a handgun or a rifle. I done seen shootouts and seen, you know, multiple people get killed at the same time, you know, and um, I done came from dance and the homie I was with ran and got under the house and got shot up. I done had so many incidents with where murder, that's all I could think of, think of basically when I think of my childhood. I mean, how old were you when you first just, you know, when you first saw your first murder? Uh, I'm gonna say uh, about nine, nine, 10 years old, you know, playing out okay. there in the front. A guy named Tiger got killed out there. I mean, a lot of people know about it happening in the mail for me right in front of my grandmother's door. My grandmother lived in the worst block of the project, in the mail for me project. So I, I probably seen more murders as a kid going backwards and forwards to my grandmother in the Melfamine Project than I seen in the Magnolia. Cause we lived in a, on a part of the Magnolia where it wasn't that much murder as it was on the new side. I mean, what does that do to a nine year old when they see someone getting killed that they were just hanging out with or they know you're only nine. And you don't really comprehend it all, but how does that affect you moving forward? It's scary, but it, it's kind of crazy when you ask me that because it, it felt scary. You know, it, it felt scary, but it was normal. It, it was kind of normal, you know. Um, I, you know, especially when when a lot of the kids that's around there telling you they seen it. You know, they didn't see it multiple times too. Or they tell you somebody got killed, or their brother or somebody got killed. You know, um, it really makes you think, like you know. I'm gonna have to do something to protect myself, like get a knife, you know? I mean, I remember I was 11 years old, I had a knife. By the time I got four, made it to 14, I had two guns. So, you know, uh, it was it was easy to it was easy to go the wrong route, you know, especially for a kid 
like me. You know, I I, I feel like I was the worst of the worst because you leave your kid around me, I beat your kid up. My mama, my mama really didn't leave me too many places. I wasn't a kid that get got opportunities to go to too many parties and stuff like that. Cause you know, I I would beat your kid up basically. That's that's who I was. I wasn't a bully, but I beat your kid up. I teach him he don't know how to fight in a minute. Well, you were born in the seventies, so yeah. you were old enough to actually remember when crack first hit the neighborhood. Yeah. 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 And what happened when that when that atomic bomb hit? Yeah, because up until that, it was pretty much people were smoking primos, like taking the 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 the, the, uh, the cocaine and lacing the, lacing the joints with it, and um and snorting. That was really the thing that was going on. But man, crack came in the eighties, and um I I seen a lot of people in my family, you know, three sixty. You know, I, I I I felt like that was a drug that was made to tear tear us down. You know, because Pretty much everybody in our community uh, either was selling crack or, or using it. Some cats my age, you know, like, because they, they didn't understand if it was cool or not. It, you know, in the beginning, they didn't know if it was a good thing or a bad thing. And, and you know, people started getting hooked, man, and seeing, seeing, you know, some of the things that some of these women did for crack, man, it was, it was crazy. Crack was, crack took over, man, everything. Okay, so, you know, you talked about how you had to start carrying guns at around 14 and, you know, crack is hitting. How, how much did you get involved in the streets or did you try to kind of stay away from it best you could? I, I, I got other skills, man. Um, yeah, I got involved in the streets for a minute. Me and my partners, we all sold crack for a minute. But, you know, you, you find out who good at it and who's not good at it. One thing that I couldn't do, I wasn't a, I wasn't a person to beat up on somebody, like like a crack fiend. Because most, most of the people that was buying the crack was either one of my partner's mama, or, or you know, somebody that I, I kind of look up to or somebody that I've been seeing all my life that I'm like, man, I'm not about to, I, I can't I can't beat on Miss da-da-da, Miss, uh, you know what I'm saying? So I had homies, they didn't care. If you don't have any money, they gonna beat, they don't care who mama it is, they beating them down. My partner Jose, God bless the dead, you ain't have his money, he gonna whip, whip on you. Me, I'm not, I, I was, that, that wasn't my thing. So I started, you know, I jumped off into the marijuana world, you know, back when they were selling the little puffies. I sell my, you know, I roll up me some puffies and sell puffies for $2 a piece. And then I was cutting hair. So I cut hair to kind of like level out with my homies. And the part used to be funny. They'd be out there all day selling their crack. All day selling crack. Uh, and when the weekend, we still kind of like had the same amount of money regardless of what they was doing. I still will go account. They was like, yeah, look what I did this week. And I count my money, I'd be like, yeah. They'd be like, yeah. And guess what? I ain't even had to put my life on line. <laughs> I ain't had to beat up nobody or nothing to make my money. So I used to be saying, yeah, bro, I ain't gonna lie. Cause they all had to get their hair cut from me still. So, so y'all still, y'all my, y'all my fiends. They used to, man, I ain't no fiend. Well, y'all my customers, however you want to say it. Y'all my customers. Yeah, but I always was somebody to find find another way to make some money. I always have been that person. That's where the rap came go. in at. Okay, and right around the early mid nineteen nineties, the bounce scene started happening in New Orleans. Yeah, yeah. What got you into rapping originally? I I got can't lie to you, man. Since the beginning, Melly Mel, man, I've been the Furious Five, man. Like I've been. You know, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. I've been listening to it since day one. I always did like rap. I always thought when I heard it the first time, I felt like I can do that. You know, and you and it was and she saying things that related to me so much. I just felt like that. Would, I, I, when I first saw it, I said, "This is me." I'm not good at basketball. I, I, I got a little J, but I got bird legs. This ain't gonna happen. Basketball not gonna happen for me. Football. I'm too small to take a hit. A real hit. I'm kind of rough, but if somebody get me right, that career gonna be over with. I'm not good in baseball or none of that. This is my lane, and I just, I, I just went for it. Every talent show, anything going on, anything dealing with a way where I could show the people my talent, I was in it. I ain't miss a talent show or nothing, anything. Some, some, mm. a couple of my teachers gave me opportunities to wrap the curriculum on the board and get an A, and I, did, I did that. Whatever I could do to get my word across or be heard, I did it. Okay, so you started rapping locally, and I guess you started Warlock Records initially? 
Now that happened really later, and I, that that wasn't really a kind of like a one off. It's kind of like they bought the album, they bought the album, gave me a, a, a set amount of money, and that was it. You know, I didn't, I I, I really didn't have a, a big involvement with Warlock, but that came after me writing the DJ Jimmy album, where I put a song uh-huh. on this album called Bounce for the Juvenile, and that triggered this whole bounce era. But the Warlock came okay. after that. Okay, so you did Bounce to the Juvenile, and that became a huge hit yeah. locally. Yeah, well, regional, not locally, like regional. five states. You know, like that back then, DJ Jimmy kind of like with with the Where They At song, he kind of like broke up, broke a little bit of the ice. Not the whole mode, but he broke a little bit of the ice where he had he he was touching like maybe ten states. Got it. Okay, and then you put out your debut album, Being Myself. Yeah, and that, that's with Warlock. Yeah. Okay, right. And you're in a bathtub full of money, basically, on the on the cover. Well, you know what? When I signed with Cash Money, they went back and made a whole new album cover. That's not actually... Oh, okay. So that, that, that was <laughs> the, the original. Okay, the original it. being myself. I'm just standing up there with a leather jacket. I'm standing up. But they, they you know, once I got back popular, of course, they're going to re-release the album and make some of that money. So that's what that was. That was a money grab for them. Uh, okay, yeah, because that looked like a pen and pixel. That's the company that I was doing. Yeah, everything, right? yeah, that's <laughs> who did most of our album. Most of our album covers are Cash Money. They might, they might have yeah, went yeah. to pen and pixel. We never know that. Okay, okay. So then, you know, you're doing your music and Cash Money, which I guess launched around 1991. They're starting to make noise, and they end up signing you. Yeah. They, yeah. Yeah. And when they signed me, it's kind of funny. When they signed me, they let all the artists on the label go and kept BG and Wayne. So mm. the day I walk in was the day a lot of the artists that they had, that they was having a success with, they let them go. They, and they was telling us, this this the new cash money. This the new wave. We about to do something big. I'm looking around like, what happened to everybody? <laughs> like, just us? <laughs> like, <laughs> you're like, yeah, y'all, y'all. I'm looking at him like, you mean me, BG, and and Shorty right here? Like, yeah, y'all, we got to, hey, they knew what they was talking about. Well, I remember you said, uh, you said, remember this, I came to cash money off a failed project. They got me from a bus stop, brother. I was getting yeah. on a bus on my way to my house coming from exactly. work. They took a chance on me. They did. I, I, hey, I, I was coming from work. And I had my hard hat on <laughs> and my fire retardant suit on. And then somebody's like, man, what kind of job you got? <laughs> I was like, man, I'm working on plants, man. You know, backwards and forth, you know, doing, you know, I was working for on-site environmental. And I'm like, man, I do turnarounds and stuff like that. And it was like, you making money? I said, yeah, I'm making a lot of money. Enough money to not want to quit my job to rap. And uh, mm. it, they, they drove me home. And the drive home changed everything. You know, uh, I, I started, he said, you still rap? I said, oh yeah, I still rap. I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I gotta live. So rap ain't paying no bills right now. So um, I, I, I sung some of my songs to him and I made a deal with him. I'm like, look, if you could pay me two grand a week, I quit my job. Matter of fact, I take a le- leave of absence right now and just start going to the studio. He was like, man, you know, they ain't really wanna make that deal. <laughs> they ain't gonna really make that deal right, th- right then and there. But I guess he couldn't sleep. He couldn't really sleep on it. He called me back the next morning like, look, it's a deal. It's a deal, man. I don't, what, you know, what I got to do, I like, look, give me three weeks advance. Let's start off with that. And um, I'll be in the studio tomorrow. And that's how that's, we took it from there. Okay, so you basically signed for six grand. If you want to look at it like that, but that wasn't really the record deal moment. That was just getting me to come to the studio. The record deal came like right. pretty much close to when we was getting ready to release it. Okay, and, and you said that you actually went over to Cash Money so you could work with Manny Fresh. Really, really, because uh, I just wanted to be around that music. I heard the UNLV album, and um, the, the, I mean, one of the songs that's on, that I put out to set it off is actually UNLV's beat, Yellow Boy beat, Badass Yellow Boy, and I love the beat so much to, I, I used it, and that was the album that I was just locked in on. Like, I'm like, damn, no disrespect to them, because them was my boys. I just felt like if I had them same beats, I could have been, you know, n- number one. No, like, no question, I would be at, at, at the top of the game. And um, 
I, I was right. Well, I remember I interviewed Mystical just recently, and he was talking about sort of the beef he was having with UNLV during that time. Yeah. And, you know, Baby was sending people at him, and he was kind of holding his own. <laughs> there were some guns pulled out during various times. I mean, no one really got messed up or nothing, but it was it was pretty serious. I mean, could, but you said that they were leaving by the time you were coming in. So do you remember any of that? that yeah, I wasn't in. I, I, was, I, I was on the ass end of that. I didn't catch none of that. But, okay. yeah, they told me. I heard stories. I heard the stories. Yeah. Okay. So then 1997, you put out Soldier Rags. Yeah. And that was your first album on Cash Money? That was my first album on Cash Money. Okay, and let me tell you, Pimpin' a Bitch is one of my favorite songs that you've done, period. What? 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 That's one of my favorite songs of all time. I just think they let me do what I wanted to do. And I was like, look, can I do a song that I want to do? Because they had me doing all this. I was like, man, I just want to do this song. It's stuck, stuck in my head. I want to just do it. I didn't know they was gonna put it on the album. I just wanted to get it out of my head. But that was yeah, a fun I mean, song. That beat with that bass line and how you were spitting on that was just crazy. And I had to go back and find it because you know my first juvenile album was 400 Degrees. So I had to go back and discover that later on. But but when I heard that, and, and I feel like, was that sort of kind of a, a takeoff of Smooth the Hustler's Broken Language? No, because I, I, I don't even know who that is, really. Okay, don't worry about it. If you listen to it at one point, you'll, you'll kind of hear sort of the way, the way w what you're saying sounds a little similar to what he was kind of saying. But if you never heard it, oh, wow. it wow. is what it is. I mean, great minds think alike. I don't know. They asked me that about Han. There you go. I, I was telling them because somebody said some other artist about Han. I was like, nah, Han is kind of like a spinoff of Soldier Rag if you listen to it, like. When I got when we got the deal, Universal wanted they like they like Soldier Rag so much. I was like, damn, can you do another song like that? I'm like, hell yeah, I can do another song like that. Matter of fact, I already got one. What to look at? All I need to do is drink. <laughs> it kept asking me why you want to drink. I said, because I want to sound like a drunk old man when I sing this song. And he was like, why? I said, trust me, it's gonna work if I if I if I can get drunk, and it worked. Okay, so 97, you put out Soldier Rags, and that actually ended up charting on the, the Billboard uh, R&B and Hip Hop charts. So now you're officially in the game. Yeah. You know, you don't have a regional hit anymore. You got an actual national project. I still wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't satisfied with that. Uh, I wasn't okay. satisfied with that. Well, and then, you know, Lil Wayne shows up on Soldier Rags. He's like 14 years old at the time. He was a monster. Wayne was a monster from day one. Day one. Been a monster. Like, I, I was telling a lot of stars then, like, man, I wish y'all could hear what we actually hear in the studio before we take the curse words out and make him change stuff. Like, you know, we was literally in there like, man, because his mama made it clear. He can't be doing this kind of music because if he, if he is, you know, we gonna, we gonna, uh, I'm, he not gonna be able to be with y'all. I'm not gonna let it, allow him to, go on a roll with y'all, do songs with y'all. So it was definitely clear that he he was not the curse. So Wayne, Wayne used to come in there with songs. We like, man, you know, you can't sing that. You can't sing that. But it's, it is it is great. It's a hit. But you can't sing that right now. Just it, it, It's just too early for that for you. So, But I think, I think everybody could see the talent in him from day one. Right, because then that same year, you guys form the Hot Boys with yeah. uh, BG, Turk, and, and Lil Wayne. But I guess there was a, another member named Bulletproof who ended up leaving the group and then got killed. No, that his name, well, his name, yeah, that's Derek. That was actually their nephew. But, uh, uh, yeah, that's, his name was Bulletproof on there. I forgot. That was Derek. Because I've been trying to think of what little Derek name was, rap name was. It was Bulletproof. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot about that. Okay, and you guys put out Get It How You Live. That was a classic. Classic. I think that was the classic. best that I that was the best High Boys album. And I don't think it's even close. I think I think the for production, song wise and everything, because we wasn't thinking about it. I think when we made that album, we were we was everybody was just hungry, the hunger and and I, we we didn't sit down and think about it. We made. We, I mean, it took us four days to record that album. Huh. 
Okay. You know, Manny make four well, or five then, beats a night. So it, it, it and I used, to, I used to tell people that. I said, man, you think we like you? I said, don't believe me if you <laughs> if you don't want to. But if you ever see us work in the studio, I'm telling you, we're making five to six songs a night. Easily. Crazy. Yeah. Okay, so these projects are starting to come out under Cash Money. And then in 1998, Cash Money signed a $30 million pressing and distribution deal with a $3 million advance yeah. to Universal, where they get 85% of the royalties, 50% of the publishing, and get to keep all the masters, which was unheard of, even yeah. to today, really. But back you know then, it, was it took us to get that deal, though. And I, it, took us, it took us a minute to get that deal because. We kept going back up to, we went to, we was going back and forth to New York for almost a year, maybe a year and a half. And Slim and, Slim and Bird, they weren't budging. You know, we wasn't budging on nothing. And I kept saying, man, we really don't need the deal from them if we're going to do these type, type of numbers. So uh, it was kind of like uh, one of them situations where we still feel like they got too much. <laughs> Truthfully. Uh, okay. So you signed, well, well, Baby and Slim signed this crazy deal, right? Now, but they're the owners of the label. You are not. You're an artist on label. Right. So did you benefit from that signing at all? Or I mean, they broke later? some bread with me. I can't lie about that. And But keep in mind, when we got that deal, we were all learning in the music industry. Like me, like, still didn't know the business, none of us. So a lot of things, a lot of things took place in that era that they didn't understand and I didn't understand, and that 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 led to one thing led to another. Right, because because Birdman just had an interview recently um, with Gillian Wallow where he mentioned that he still makes like twenty to thirty million a year off his masters. So it just yeah. goes to show how important masters are in this game. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So then you sign this huge deal and the premier project to come out after the signing was Juvenile 400 Degrees. No, it was the Big Timers. Oh, it was the Big Timers first. Big okay, timers, my, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> Woo, Kimosabi and all of that. <laughs> I was second. Okay. Just remember when we, like signed even the, though you... when we signed the deal, the Big Timers album had just came out, right? It was like just coming out. And so when we signed the deal, they just re-released the Big Timers album and changed the color of it. One was green, the other one was blue. And they, we added songs and took songs off. But the Big Timers album was the first release. Okay, and that's uh, how you love that. Yeah. Okay. So that comes out, but I felt like when your project came out, that's what really put Cash Money on the map. You know the funny part? The next project I think was gonna be the Hot Boys, but Universal stepped in and said, nah, they ain't wanna hear it. Universal just wanted my project to be, well, they wanted my project to be first, but I, just, I thought, I felt like it was too soon too, cause I wasn't ready. I, I really wasn't ready. I, I, I felt like I hadn't recorded the songs that I needed to record to put an album out. So it was me a lot pushing like, nah, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I need some room. I need to think. I need to think about, you know, because I'm thinking about this is going to be my career. This this is my everything for me. I want to take my time with it. Look, because last time I got rushed and it didn't work out right. So. Well, why was it called 400 Degrees? I, I never figured that one out. Hmm? Well, why I was it called 400 Degrees? With me, I bake my fish at 400. I bake my chicken at 400. That's just my number, period. You know, period. Because <laughs> people always ask me that. I say, man, listen, that's what I bake at. Okay. I learned something <laughs> new today. All right. So, well, the album, I don't know if the single or the album comes out first, but when Ha came out, it was like everything changed. You ain't lying. But I think, not, you're right about that, but I really think the, the, the song that really made my album take off, start well, start to take off on record sales, and you probably wouldn't believe it, it was Follow Me Now. Really? All right, okay. let me show you. How it came out, right? How, how was the first release? The album sales weren't doing too great. 
when Ha came out. Hmm. Right? So so on comes this idea. I went back in the studio, so on comes this idea. Well, Jay-Z remixed the Ha, right? So when Jay-Z mm-hmm. sent the remix to us, we, it was kind of unexpected. We didn't know he was going to do that anyway. He did it on his own. So uh, the idea popped back then. Wait, let's go back and put this Jay-Z song on the album because Jay-Z wasn't on the album either originally. Like, we're going to put this Jay-Z version on the album and once you record another song, so I recorded Follow Me Now. Not knowing that it was a Carlos Santana sample and not knowing that the record was already big before I said anything on it. It blew up. It blew up, but it didn't. It blew up in the, for the, in the Latino community. Not so where it didn't look big at. It was big everywhere else. Like the the album started selling, started selling like crazy all of a sudden. Then that's when they start realizing, wait, the back that ass up record is the hottest song on the album. Period. We need to take a chance with it because that song had started taking off in the clubs just on its own. And so it was kind of like a no-brainer to make that a single. And that's when Back to the Ass Up came out. That's when it, the sales just skyrocketed. Then people started listening to the album and started seeing like, damn, right. it's a good album. Yeah. Right. And you said that you actually didn't even want to record that song, Back to the Ass Up. No, I I wanted to record it. I didn't want it to be a single. Because my oh, okay. whole music career was making that kind of music before before I got with Cash Money, and I'm like, look, I don't want to be remembered as a booty shaking, bounce, booty shaking, music making person. I want to be remembered as an artist that made a lot of different kinds of music, you know. And um, I think I got my point across. Oh yeah, I mean that ended up being your biggest song ever. Yeah. But I did it my way. Hands down. I did it my way. Like Sinatra said, I did it my way. <laughs> I I try to do uh, it in I try to do it in third person, like you know, like talk to a woman and t- tell her about herself and tell her good things about herself and tell her the reason why she should be with me, cause I'm all that too. But you know, like how huh, third person, I like to I like to be the instigator. Mm. Okay, and Little Wayne is featured on Back That Ass Up. At the very end, yeah, should have been on the whole song. He should have been. He should have had a verse on that. Oh, okay. It got taken off. No, I said he should have had one on it. Nah, he never did. Oh, he should have had a verse on it. Nah, it was already done. He was like, I got to be on there. Like, well, do whatever, do whatever you want to do. Go ahead. That's exactly how it went. Mm. He's like, look, I got to be on there. All right, do what you want to do. He's like, drop it like that. You know, he always was funny. (laughs) <laughs> seeing Wayne go in back then it was funny as hell well uh didn't DJ Jubilee try to sue you over that song saying yeah, it was similar to, to his which ultimately you won that case yeah I'm still cool with Jubilee it was it, it was a bad idea on his behalf he knew and I know that was my song from day one he didn't even try to pull me to the side and you know talk me like man I ain't want to even go through with this man like man but the problem was they had collected publishing. You know, the problem mm-hmm. was they collected some of that money. I don't know how they got it mixed up, but they sent them some of my money. And uh, that 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 wind up being, you know, Universal not about to sit there and let somebody say that one of their biggest songs, one of their biggest artists, one of the biggest songs that the artist made is, is somebody else's song. They not about to allow that. So, of course, they sent the team now, too. There you go. And uh, by 2005, it actually ended up, you ended up winning the case overall. Yeah, I won the case. I, I mean, it, he, everybody knew that was my song. If you was from, if you were right. from New Orleans and you heard the song long before it got, before I sung it with a Cash, because I've been made that song. I just took a long time to record it, you know, but it's, everybody knew it was mine. I was singing it already. I remember when I interviewed Mystical, he actually said that that was the song that he tried to, kind of emulate when he did Shake Your Ass. Like he wanted his own version of that song and that ended up being one of his biggest songs. That's my buddy, he could do whatever he wanted to do. That's, all. <laughs> That's my buddy there, man, you know. He allowed to, like, he, could, he allowed to sample yep. whatever I got if he wanted to. There you go. Well, and then years later, Drake ended up remaking the song uh, on Practice, on yeah, the Take Care album. Yeah, that was big, man. 
that was big. I was hoping it was going to be a single or something like that. Let me make a little bit more money. But <laughs> now, shout out to Drake, man. He broke bread with me, took me out on the road with him, took a couple shows, man. That's a good dude. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So with all these singles, the album goes four times platinum. Yeah. Here you are, a kid growing up in, in one of the worst slums in America, having to see murder, poverty, drug dealing, and now you have a project that's four times platinum. How, how do you get your head around that? Because you're still in your early 20s or mid-20s by that time? Yeah, about 25, 26. Man, it's hard to get, you, you just high on life when stuff like that happens for you. And, you know, I wish I was, I wish I was smart enough then to sit back and just really take it all in, but I was just so excited and moving around. I, I stayed busy the whole while. I never got a chance to really sit back and take it all in. Like now, I really take it all in. And uh, I really mm -hmm. look back like, damn, you really were, you know, you really did, you did, you did some real big things, man. Right, because then the next year, uh, the second Hot Boys album comes out, Guerrilla Warfare. Yeah. Which goes platinum. And that's got the I Need a Hot Girl single on yeah. it, which is one of the big Cash Money songs yeah. as well. Yeah. One of my favorite songs that I'm not on. As a matter of fact, I play that in every last one of my shows. Because the part that Turk, Turk said, uh, I like them hot. The ones that don't tell you to stop. That part, he said, I like a project bitch, a hood rat bitch. One that don't give a fuck and say she took that dick. When he say that part right there, I like that part of the song so much, I made my own song. That's where that's where the whole uh, uh, project shit come from. I took that mm. idea and, and like, you know what, I'm gonna do it my way. And uh, I just took that little piece of the hook and made a whole song out of it. Which is, that wound okay. up being a hit too. <laughs> yeah. And then that same year, you put out the G-Code album. Yeah. And that has a, you understand, You understand. That album did good, did pretty good too. Uh, I think what it what's the number was two million. Yeah, yeah double like, platinum. Yeah, double platinum. Yeah, uh, and I thought it was too quick. I wanted to still work. I still wanted to put more singles out on four hundred degrees. I just felt like four hundred degrees could have did another five, six, another three or four million copies because mm. four hundred degrees could have been a single. Project Ghetto Children could have been a single. The song with me yeah, and love the, the Run For It song could have been a single. So it was a couple songs on there that I feel like we didn't we didn't tap into. Because I really wanted to tap into the uh, Ghetto Children uh, song. I really wanted to shoot a video to that bad. Oh, yeah, I love Ghetto Children. I was listening to that on the way here, and I'm yeah. like, okay, this is the song that I was bumping. To and death Put Your Sets Up. Came out. Right. The Put Your Sets Up yeah. song. That song has created so many fights and tore up so many clubs. Put your sets up, boy, what? They go crazy on that shit. They lose their mind on that song. So I just feel like I, I, I could have. And you know who really made me sit back and think? Puffy. Puffy grabbed me and said, man, you getting ready to put another album out? He said, all it, man, man, you supposed to like, he like, man, he like, every song on the album is a single. He said, you need, to, you need to really make them slow down and don't put another album out on you right now. You need more videos, more singles to this album. And I, I, I agree. Yeah, I, I didn't, I agree. like at the moment I was just, I had so much going on in my head. I couldn't, I wasn't listening. I should have listened though. Well, you put out the G-Code album and then the next year, 2000, Rough Riders and Cash Money go on tour together. Wow. Yeah. I got to be on stage with the legend. Wow. DMX. The legend. DMX. Wow. That's when I learned, that's when I learned I couldn't perform. That's when I learned I ain't <laughs> shit on stage. Cause I kept saying like, well after the first show when they said, it was one of them shows, they said they going on before us. I like, you who, what? I said, well, man, nah, fuck that. Fuck that. Ain't no way in the world I'm going on stage after no fucking DMX. I don't give a damn. Like, man, you, is you crazy? This dude gonna crawl. Bark, cry, pray. By the time he get to his fifth song, he got the crowd. Shit, they be draped, they be ready, they be throwing shit on money and shit on stage to him. He's, he he a different. I don't think they have. I don't think 
in the music industry, in the rap industry, I think he's the greatest performer. And I don't think he's even fucking close. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would have to agree. Yeah. Yeah, DMX, forget it. Now, wasn't TK Kirkland on the tour with you guys? Yeah, I mean, he actually was around us a lot, too. He was actually traveling with us. Yeah, TK yeah. Kirkland. TK, TK yeah, was... I remember... Uh, when I interviewed him uh, just recently, we were talking about DMX because he had just passed. He told me this crazy story how they were all on the tour bus together and DMX sees like a car full of girls and he has them stop the bus. He jumps in the car with the girls, drives two blocks, crashes, <laughs> and then gets arrested. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like X right there, man. That sounds like X. That sounds... <laughs> <laughs> TK got some stuff. T got some stories. He got a thousand yeah. of them. I mean, what was the craziest DMX experience that you you got to see during that tour? Yeah, yeah that, that I'm telling you that I, that got to be it. Oh, we was in the lobby, and I didn't know he really had dogs with him. And uh, his dogs, boy, they cut up in that lobby, boy. They took when I tell you they took shits everywhere they felt like it. <laughs> He was like, man, let him do it. He let his dogs do what they want to do. <laughs> they all they dope. I said, man, damn. Shit, where they want to shit at? You know, I ain't get in his business or nothing to say that. I just sat there and stood there. And said, and I let him shut. Look around like, damn, they take pit bulls now. <laughs> I'm scared to death. I'm not moving. I'm scared to death. I'm not moving. <laughs> but I done got on the elevator with him with the dogs and everything. He walk, he walk in the elevator. And I, you know, his, his security, it was holding the door for him. He got, he said, you good? He give me a bottle of Hennessy. And then the dogs <laughs> walk in that motherfucker. I'm stiff as a motherfucker. <laughs> he said, you all right? You good? I'm, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm scared like, what? like, boy, this fucking dog bite me, man. <laughs> it's gonna be fucked up. <laughs> yeah, but man, X, man, me, X, X, man, X always showed me love. X would always say like, I'm one of them ones. He's like, Jew, I don't like too many rappers, but you're one of the ones I do like. He used to always say that to me. Yeah, I remember I was living in Oakland at the time, and I went to the Cash Money Rough Rider show at the Oakland Coliseum. And I that guess someone had the bright idea to put a bunch of folding metal chairs on the floor. And before anyone got to actually perform, a full blown riot broke out. Everyone started hitting each other with the chairs. Oh, you talking I don't know about when the guy show. dude came? Man, they had a d dude fell from the top of the Coliseum. Yeah, pe people were Dad, people were throwing that dude other got people up, from that like dude the dude got the up and was. I was like, damn, this motherfucker got to be bionic, man. Because we was we was getting ready. We was trying to grab the turntables. They grabbed man and fresh turntables, man. They broke them motherfuckers up. They grabbed them. They was looking at us too. So, bam, I said, damn, boy, them 1200s, boy, <laughs> look at that. I said, ooh, that's the real deal. <laughs> so we stopped carrying turntables. We started making the, making the motherfuckers who throw an event have the turntables there for us. But yeah, the Coliseum, hmm. we never, you know what? I, it took me at least 10 years. I had to go 10 years later, I went back to the Coliseum and performed. But up until, up until that, that we never performed in the Coliseum. We had shows booked there but they always tell the place down every year. Every right, time. right. Because with Oakland, they just didn't have a lot of hip hop shows. So all the gangs never got to really be around each other. So something like that, all the different gangs and neighborhoods were all oh. in one spot. And when they're usually just, there just were no hip hop shows in Oakland all through the nineties. And then, yeah, like I said, all hell break, broke loose. Cops were pulling out guns. I remember I was on the floor. Like, it was it was crazy. <laughs> Man, the Bay, a different world, a different hey, animal. It is a different world. And then, look, if you ain't yep. built like that, you can't go to the Bay. You already know the Bay. Bay, every bit of steel. That's what I call them, the steel. You can't go over there soft like cotton. They not having it. They not having yep. it. Well, then that same year, the Baller Blocking movie came out. And uh, T.K. Kirkland's in it. Uh, Anthony Johnson is in it. And then, yeah. of course, all the, the Cash Money crew is in it. Man, your boy, uh, every day, every day they try to go at A.J. Head cracking jokes. He was tearing them up in the project, though. Every day on the set, it was funny. Like, when you're on sets with, with, con with comedians, they, they, they make the time go good because they're cracking jokes about every little thing. And that's what we got all day out of him and T.K., all day cracking jokes. Mm. <laughs> 
Okay, so then that next year, 2001, you put out uh, Project English. Yeah. That goes platinum. Yeah. Now, was that around the time where you decided to leave Cash Money for the first time? That was the era. That Well, that was the era when I wasn't really around. Like, like a lot of the songs were songs that, I don't know, that didn't make it out, that probably wouldn't have made it if I was around. Like, I, I don't know to put it was, I think that was the error because Juve the Great was actually after we negotiated. So, yeah, I, that was yeah. around the era when I was leaving. Okay, and, you know, and I heard you, you know, I've seen interviews around this whole situation. And you say, you know, my reason to leave cash money is the same reason most artists leave the label, money. Yeah. And, you know, you, you said a lot of stuff. You said, you know, I'm working like a slave and I'm getting nothing. So I get an entertainment lawyer to find out what cash money uh, were, who the, you know, and found out cash money were who they say they were with me. And you said, pay me and we're cool. And you wanted like $4 million, but they didn't want to pay you and ended up turning into a whole thing. Um, you know, when you first start approaching them about money situations, how was it? I can't even remember because I don't think I ever approached them about money. You know, somebody told me something and I just started researching. Mm. Yeah, I don't remember me ever okay. approaching them, asking them anything about money, though. Okay, got it. Okay. Well, um... Yeah, because I don't like to really talk that? about cash money because I'm signed to them. Okay. Okay, fair I enough. I don't like fair to enough. do that. Okay. Uh, right around that same year, Mac 10 ends up joining cash money also. Yeah. Were you around during that time no, when, he, when he came around? No, no I, was go- I was gone like the okay, next six years. <laughs> Okay, well, you guys work stuff out, and then the Juvie the Great album comes out uh, in 2003. Uh, it goes platinum, and you get your first number one song with Slow Motion. Yeah, and really it wasn't my song, Soldier Slim song. So technically, exactly. I never took credit for that record because my dude created it, and it was supposed to be on his album. And he he kind of like, he went to my brother and asked my brother to talk to me, like talk your brother into putting it on his album. I think it'd be a better look on Universal than the company he was signed to. So that's how that went. But that was pretty much Soldier Slim number one single. So if you want to be technical, I never had a number one single. Mm. You're still on it though. Yeah, I'm on it. You're still <laughs> and on it. It was on my album. And it was on your album. Yeah. Well, uh, there was a, a line on there on that song, you said, you must have heard about them hoes that I beat up in my home. They wasn't telling the truth, nah, baby. You know they was wrong. Nah, we don't do that. Married life, now. Nah, I don't talk about stuff like that. Don't talk about that. Nah. Okay, we'll, we'll skip yeah, it. I'll go with it. Okay. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Well, uh, the song comes out, and it's a massive hit, and then that same year, November 26, 2003, Soldier Slim gets killed. Yeah. 26 years old. Uh, apparently, he got killed on the front lawn of his mother's house. And he was shot three times in the face, once in the chest. I don't know. Uh, I don't know the you, amount of times he got shot. I don't know if it was in the lawn or in the alley. I'm not sure. So I don't like that's Oh, okay. Yeah, because you know they always change stuff up a little bit. So I don't, I don't I'm, I'm not sure about, 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 about that. But it was like, you know, he was our Tupac. He was the Tupac of, of of New Orleans and not only New Orleans, all the surrounding areas. And, you know, I just felt like, I feel like New Orleans should have protected him a little better than that. I feel like that. I blame, I blame, I put the blame on his, the people that surrounded him. I always did. When you first heard the news that he got killed, especially with the success you guys just had, how'd you feel? I felt like I lost my little brother, man. You know, um, like I got, like I'm getting cheated. Yeah, like I'm getting cheated out of something. You know, our dreams and our plans, well, our first plan was to take over New Orleans with music. We was doing that. And our next plan was to take over the country with music. We were doing that. Um, and for him not to be around to see how, how successful he could be and see how big of a fan base that he could build and how big of an artist that he could be, I feel like I, we, I got cheated out of seeing that and allowing that to happen because I've been wanting to be that person to open those doors up for him. 
Well, there was an investigation into his murder and uh, someone named Jarrell Smith. We ain't gonna do uh, that one either. That, cause that's, no, we're I'm not still, talking about it. Yeah, because I'm still in the city, bro. I'm still riding through the city. And I don't like saying Fair people enough. names and putting people out. I don't like doing that. That's dangerous. Got it. You know? Got it. I respect that. Okay, well, rest in peace, Soldier Slim, man. People yeah, still man. talk to talk about him to this day. Um, you know, a huge loss of someone that looked like he was finally on his way to really yeah. becoming the star that he always yeah. was. Yeah. I thought, like, I thought he was going to have, I thought his next move was to put out a platinum album of his own. And it didn't happen, yeah. so... It's still, it's still, it's Sad. still stinging. It's still sting. Yeah. Well, then the last Hot Boys album comes out, Let Them Burn. And and this album doesn't really have the hits of the other projects. Yeah, I, again, I wasn't really around. Uh, mm. So I don't really know how the song I got put together. I think they took songs from here and there and put it together. But I didn't really participate in that at all. So okay. I, don't, I don't know how that, how that would happen. Well, and then at that point, you end up leaving Cash Money. Uh, Manny Fresh ends up leaving Cash Money the next year. And then you sign a new deal with Atlantic Records. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, it's for, you sign a deal for yourself and also a separate deal for UTP Records. Yes. Yo, pretty good time, now, man. Hit, couple hits came out of that. Know you clap, and, uh, you know. Uh, Right. You know, uh, rodeo, slow motion. Not slow motion, I mean rodeo and... Uh, what other rodeo. Song? Yeah, rodeo. Yeah. Yep. Well, I interviewed Young Buck recently, and he was telling me how right around that time, he yeah. actually ended up joining up with you. Buck is a bitch. Don't, bruh. I, I hate Buck. I hate Young Buck, fam. Buck is a bitch-ass nigga, so we ain't gonna talk about Buck at all, period. Yeah. I don't f that, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair, fair enough. Yeah, I don't I'm sorry. What, what was bro, that, bro? Chris just said that we had a few more minutes left. We are gonna wrap it up. You're asking all the wrong questions. Talk about yeah, me. Don't, man. You gotta ask okay, me. Okay, I'm sorry. Look, <laughs> hey, do, do yeah, me whatever. a favor. <laughs> just ask me about me. Don't don't throw them names like this. But I can't. Okay, man, okay. I hate like positive uh, Okay. It was your interview he done that really made me trigger back to like fuck him. Like I really fuck him for real, fam. Okay. Okay, and, fair and enough. That can't yeah. come out for the record, okay? I don't care what he put put out. I don't give a fuck. Fuck Buck. I mean what I'm saying. 